Listeners, readers, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll end up with a much richer understanding of the title at hand, all while learning to read everything else a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, editor, and PhD in literature. And for anyone out there who's not actually trafficking in rare books, Foxed Page might be something of a mystery, but foxing is simply those little tan dots that you sometimes see on the pages of really old, beloved books. The book we're talking about today is not, in fact, all of that old. It is, in fact, for me, very beloved. We're going to talk about The Years by Annie Ernaux, who recently was awarded the Nobel Prize. As always, the lecture will be delivered in three chunks. The first one, there will not be any spoilers in the first one, uh, and we'll be talking about why I think this book is worth your time. We'll be talking a bit about Ernaux's biography, and then we'll dive into the prose. As always, in the second and third sections, we will be diving even more deeply into why this book is so incredible and, and in some ways, what it is that has earned Annie Ernaux the Nobel Prize. So let's get started. Okay, so first and foremost, those of you who would like an even more uh, immersive experience, you can watch this lecture on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. You can see yet another background that is chosen specifically because of the Ami Ekno. You can also check out my, um, my Claudine collar that I am wearing, which is otherwise known as a Peter Pan. I'm looking at it here, um, and honestly, it looks like it might be from 1940. It is so beloved. It's not from 1940, but it looks like it might be. Uh, this is the first time I'm going to have a costume change. I'm going to have three different outfits that I am going to wear during the course of the three lectures, largely because Annie Ernaux deserves it. This is one um, incredible writer, and um, I have to imagine a very, very fashionable person. I can see that by all of her photos that I've seen online. But also, uh, this is a book that spans from her childhood, her birth in 1940, all the way through 2008. So it's giving me a good opportunity to, um, you know, try out a couple of different outfits, reflect a couple of different versions of this Annie Ernaux. Okay, so many of you are thinking, why on earth are we reading this book? Uh, it is somewhat obscure, potentially, if you're just a kind of straight ahead reader of English, if you're just an American, you know, out there not paying a lot of attention to who is winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. If you are, in fact, wondering who won the Nobel Prize for Literature last year in 2022, the answer is Annie Ernaux. So I have been a fan of hers forever, 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 largely because her prose is so approachable. It is, uh, you know, she has these sentences that are very, very clear. Her diction is very clear. She writes it, it, very descriptively, but in very plain French in lots of ways. She's known for being very straightforward in her prose, uh, which is actually very, very helpful if you are someone who is not reading a ton of French literature, who's not in fact a native speaker, but who wants to dive in to a French novel just to keep your keep your skills uh, honed. And the other thing about Ami Arnaud that I have always appreciated, I'm holding them up here for you to see, is the fact that each of them is very slim. So this is my library of, of many of her works. And you can see that each of them, you know, they're, they're really more like a novella. Here I have uh, Passion Simple. I'm looking at the pages here. Oh my gosh, also a lot of white space on these pages. Uh, it is 77 pages long. So I have been a huge fan of Annie Arnaud, partially because the prose is so clear and easy to read in lots of ways, but also because that prose also very, very sophisticated. She is a writer who is, um, she's not a philosopher per se, but there is a lot of sort of a lot that is happening on the page that you don't necessarily get from the complexity of the prose. It's, it's a deceivingly simple prose, and I really appreciate her for that. Her masterpiece is a book called The Years, which I actually had not read. It came out in 2008, and it wasn't because I'm afraid of reading a slightly longer book. It is more than twice as long as any of her other works. And here's the French version, here's the English version. And it, it's a real departure in lots of ways from what she had written. At the same time, it's very much of a piece with her oeuvre. It made a big splash in 2008, not so much in the United States, but certainly in France. It was a huge bestseller. 
Part of the reason why it was so popular in France and maybe not as popular here is another reason why I think you might need a little talking into reading this book, which is simply that a lot of the cultural and historical references are going to be opaque to a reader uh, who is American, who doesn't know a lot about French popular culture. So I think uh, th there's a bit of a hurdle there. And yet in the English translation, which I think is excellent by Alison Strayer, she does a very good job. You know, if you don't know the French reference, it's fine. You just can kind of, you know, scoot right across. And uh, at times I think the translations are very good. She generally sticks with the French popular culture, but she'll do a good job of translating an idiomatic expression when one is important. I have to say, I was a tad daunted. I was a tad bit like, gosh, these are a lot of things that I don't really know what's going on. Um, and honestly, I was like, you know what I'm gonna do here? I'm just gonna do some skimming. I'm just gonna skim over some parts of this that are like a little bit uh, opaque to me, not because the prose is difficult, but because I don't know who this movie star is, or I don't know who um, you know this French politician or this historical figure is. But here's what happened. I tried to start skimming, and it was virtually impossible. It was so, the prose is so engaging and it's even if you don't understand the reference and there are lots and lots of them, fairly soon you'll understand a different reference or you will understand the gist of, of what Arnaud is trying to say. There also, despite the specificity of the French, cultural and historical and popular culture references, uh, there is a universality of this book, especially for women, that I think is just stunning. You know, historically, there was enough happening uh, internationally that we all, I think, were part of, obviously, uh, the women's movement. Or she has a, just an absolutely gorgeous passage about 9-11. There, there are several different uh, times where it does feel very, very international. And also, again, there's a, there's a universality to being a, a member of a family for being a spouse potentially, for being someone's son or daughter. So there is a universality of it that I think certainly outweighs the specificity of the references. If that is not enough of a sales job uh, to, to sort of spur you on in your reading if you haven't already finished, I'll also tell you that Oprah says that you should definitely be reading this book. And I like Oprah's picks. I mean, you, you might be thinking that that's a little, um, you know, that I'm sort of joking there or that I am, um, you know, looking down potentially on Oprah. And au contraire, I am not looking down on Oprah. I really love what she has done for all sorts of voices and for really bringing a lot of people to the light. And I'm, I was very happy when I saw that in Oprah Daily, um, they really were, they were pushing our Annie or no. So take it, if you don't want to take my word, take, uh, take uh, Oprah's word. As I said before, last year she won the Nobel Prize. This is in 2022. And she won it, the Nobel Prize Committee said the following. She won it for the courage and clinical acuity with which she uncovers the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory. I love a lot of what they're saying here. The clinical acuity is, is a little bit what I was getting at when I was talking about the clarity of the prose. This is not, there's not a lot of, um, you know, figurative language, not so, not a lot of flowery stuff, not a lot of, you know, uh, of, of uh, metaphors or similes. This is a very sort of clinical approach to uh, her writing in general, to a bunch of different phases of her life. Uh, she writes a whole book about her father. She writes a book about her mother's Alzheimer's. She writes a book about her experience of having an abortion. She writes an experience, I'm looking at the books here, oh, about having an affair uh, with someone who was very different than she was. And so each in each one of these places, I think clinical acuity is such a great phrase because there is an unsparing, kind of unflinching approach that, that it also is, is sort of limpid. It's that very clear uh, uh, sense of really looking at something under a microscope without losing uh, the larger impact. And I love this, the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory. So to me, that it, it describes the years perfectly, but it also describes every single one of her books. This notion of um, the collective restraint of, of personal memory, it's this idea, it, and these the, the roots and the estrangements. There, there, it, memory is sort of the, the overarching you know, 
theme in all of her work. And it is, in fact, very, very personal. What she's discussing are very personal memories, you know, some very difficult and some really excellent times in her life. But also there is constantly this kind of philosophical estrangement and, and this erudite look at, uh, at memory. Okay, we're going to discuss very briefly Annie Ernaud's uh, biography. It seems a little weird to give you this quick sketch because if you have already finished the years, lots of this is already obvious to you because in many ways this book is autobiographical. Um, you'll notice earlier I called it a novel and then quickly retracted that. It is not, in fact, a novel and it, in many ways it defies categorization, which I love. The French have never been so hung up as Americans are uh, in terms of like, which section of the bookstore is this going into? Is it memoir? Is it essay? Is it autobiography? In French, they have something called autofiction, uh, which I think this is very much like that, but it's also blended with essay. Autofiction simply being kind of a melding of memoir and fiction. As you know, if you have read the book, Annie Arnaud was born in 1940. So she's 82 years old now. Her birthday is in September. She was the only child of working class parents who, I love this resonance um, because I've just recently recorded uh, my series on Flaubert and Madame Bovary. Um, she was born in a town right near Yvetot, but she, was, she grew up in Yvetot, which is a town that figures heavily in Flaubert's life. So both of those towns are close to Rouen, which is one of the towns that, that um, well, it's, it's the big city uh, in Madame Bovary. So she grew up in Normandy. Again, for those of you who uh, listen to the Madame Bovary lecture, it, we're very far north, uh, almost to England, kind of on the channel there. They're on the Seine, uh, the Seine which flows from the English Channel-ish down uh, into Paris. So um, the, the climate would have been blustery and um, and chilly and rainy. And I think that, that maybe informed part of who Annie Ernaux is. Much like everything that we talked about with Madame Bovary, there, Annie Ernaux has this real preoccupation in the best of ways with passion. So she wrote a book called Passion Simple, which is about having an affair. But all of her books are, are, are pretty frank about sexuality and, and very um, clear about sexual desire on the part of a woman, which I love because, you know, if, if Madame Bovary was 1857 and she was born in 1940, you know, roughly 100 years later, we do have some echoes, in fact, of Madame Bovary. So you have this real um, concern with sexuality and with sex and with passion and romance. You also, um, in lots of Annie Arnaud, um, but especially in the years, we have this real fixation on consumerism and on, uh, on advertisements and on the culture that is really always telling us we need more and everything is obsolete and you need to buy something new, which again has this incredible echo of Madame Bovary. Uh, there's also a lot of concern in both Madame Bovary and in Annie Arnaud's The Years about progress and about history. In Madame Bovary, it's mostly about medical things uh, and how they maybe don't work out so well for some of us, but all of this kind of faith in medical science. Whereas in the years, there's this real testing of, of whether or not progress is a good thing. So um, in Annie Ernaux's um, younger years, in the years, we learn a lot about her political activism. She was politically active, still, I imagine, is throughout her lifetime. And, you know, a lot of what happens with the information age and a lot of what happens with the next generation, it seems to me that Annie Ernaux is a bit disappointed. So there is this kind of questioning of, of how well progress is serving uh, an entire culture and a country. In both Madame Bovary and in the years, we have a lot of class issues. So Annie Arnaud is decidedly working class in her roots. And then because she went to university and because she became very educated and became a school teacher and because she spent time in Paris and time abroad in England as an au pair, she became very aware of her class and, and, and sort of the, um, the limitations of her class and, and sort of the very subtle differences between lower middle class, middle class, working class, all of these distinctions in France that again were also really, really important in Madame Bovary. So she was married around 21, very early certainly, to someone that she met at university. They had two sons together. Eventually she has one granddaughter. I'm not sure if you've gotten that far in the book. She had an affair and divorced her husband. I'm not exactly sure about the, um, about the timeline there. 
and was someone, you will find this in the book if you haven't quite finished yet, someone who took quite a few young lovers, uh, which again, I think this through line of her, of her uh, acceptance of female sexual desire is really important throughout all of her novels, but certainly in the years. Okay, speaking of the years, it is time to dive in. So we're gonna take a look at the structure of the book. We're gonna dive right into the beginning here. So for anyone out there who is listening or who is watching and uh, is here because you would like to be a slightly stronger reader, you would like to get a little more out of the time you spend reading, you'd like a richer experience of reading, my very simple, but I think very effective piece of advice is simply to pay attention. So one of the things uh, that you should pay attention to at the start, well, if the book says the Nobel Prize 2022, that's pretty great. That is not a bad thing to pay attention to. Here we have um, the title. The title of the book is The Years. It's a very direct translation in French, it's Les Années. And it's very apt, it's very broad. Uh, and it, it also, there's a preoccupation with time and with time changing and, and, and there's a certain sort of universality in the years. It's not my years, it's the years. So I think right at the very beginning, Ami Arnaud is, is sort of tipping her, her hand a bit and showing us that this is a, it's, it's a story of the years, which is going to be communal and it's going to be slightly more general than a, you know, any sort of autobiography or even a memoir. And when we, when we take a first look at the, at the book, what we notice right from the start is that it's very fragmented. So on page seven of my translation here by Alison Strayer, we have, um, we have a, a sentence at the beginning, this declarative sentence, all the images will disappear. I love going back and looking at the beginning of a book again. For those of you who have finished and are now going back, what a striking sentence. All the images will disappear. What I love about that is one of the main structural elements of the book is that Annie Ernaud describes periodically a photograph, um, different photographs as she moves along. And the photographs that she describes are the way that we know, essentially like we know where to focus our attention. There is this one girl who we are going to see as a girl and then as a young teen and then as an older teen. And eventually we see her as a grandmother. This notion of these, these images that are going to tell us the way that the years are passing, the fact that they will disappear is very, very striking. And in fact, true, of course. And then we dive, so this is indented. We've got this very first line here that it is the beginning of a paragraph. All the images will disappear. And then right underneath that, we have an M dash, one of my very favorite grammatical marks. We have an M dash, uh, and then we have a, essentially what is a fragment. And each, we have a series of these fragments with M dashes. So I'm gonna read just the very beginning of the first three on this page. The woman who squatted to urinate in broad daylight. That's the first M dash, then there's some more about her. The tearful face of Alida Vali as she danced with Georges Wilson in the film, The Long Absence. The next one, the man passed on a Padua sidewalk in the summer of 1990 his hands tied at the shoulders, instantly summoning the memory of thalidomide. So we have these three very different fragments here. We have a, a woman who is urinating behind a stone wall um, in broad daylight. We have a, an actress, and then we have uh, someone, a stranger, who is, um, is a very specific moment in time, a very specific generation who um, suffered physical deformities because of thalidomide. So interestingly, in the French version, when we dive into the beginning here, um, you do have that same first sentence and it also is indented. Toutes les images disparaîront. Um, and then we don't have any M dashes. We simply have lowercase and we have these blocks of text. So I actually think that the, the M dash might be a little bit of overkill. I like the idea of, of this as seeming more fragmentary and, and a little bit less list-like. But I also understand, um, you know, the idea of wanting a little more order. Uh, it's very maybe American. And wanting a, uh, a, something that sets off the, uh, these blocks of text that we have. So it continues this series of these fragments and it's everything from random people to superstars, well, film stars, to other random people. And then on page eight, 
we have this kind of interesting phenomenon here where if you are a reader of Annie Ernaud, um, you might recognize this woman. This is on the, this is the second fragment on page eight. The majesty of the elderly woman with Alzheimer's who wore a flowered smock like all the residents of the old folks' home. So if you are a reader of Annie Arnaud, you know that in fact she wrote an entire book about her mother's Alzheimer's. So you, you in the midst of these strangers, if, uh, you know, assume, we're assuming that the person, the man she saw on the street in Italy um, who had the thalidomide uh, deformity, gosh, I hate, I just don't think that's quite probably the right word, but he had the effects of the thalidomide that were obvious to her. Um, then we have this woman who is described in much the same way. She's sort of on par with these other people uh, in terms of being, she's not named. We don't know that she is um, in relationship with our narrator. We don't even really have a very good sense of the narrator here. And yet, if you are a reader of Annie Arnaud, you know that in fact, this is likely a nod to her mother. And then right across the page here, on page nine, we have the newborn flailed in the air like a skinned rabbit in the delivery room of the clinic Cardurin Pasteur, found again half an hour later, dressed and sleeping on his side in a little bed, one hand outside, and the sheet pulled up to his shoulders. So I don't, I have not read anything um, about Annie Ernaud that makes me think that that, came, that comes from one of her, um, one of her specific books. And yet, because of the intimacy of this sentence, um, you know, this impression of the newborn uh, as being like a skinned rabbit in a very specific uh, delivery room, and then found again half an hour later with, with the exact sort of pose of the baby, that sort of intimate pose and that vantage that, uh, that looks like, you know, you, you almost are forced to see this vantage from, you know, the, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm making like a lying down kind of a, 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 a gesture here. So I'm imagining that Annie Arnaud is lying down in her hospital bed and it's suddenly sort of awakened or is, or is surprised a bit by the image of her infant son uh, who is lying on his side. The fact that the infant is also male leads us to believe in perhaps that this is Annie Arnaud's son. So the effect of, and this goes on, we have um, more and more, we have next the image of Scarlett O'Hara. Very importantly, we have mention of Molly Bloom. So Molly Bloom is a literary character, comes from James Joyce's Ulysses. She is the wife of Leopold um, Bloom. And Molly Bloom is, is a, um, as is Scarlett O'Hara. These are images that come back up again and again throughout uh, throughout the novel in ways that are really striking because it's very much the way that memory would work. It would be fragmentary, things would rise in your memory um, and, and then dissipate, certain things would come back up. Um, for me, it's not so much Scarlett O'Hara or Molly Bloom for that matter, but you know, there's certain um, literary figures who mine might be a little more like a, you know, Little House on the Prairie, like a little Laura Ingalls Wilder kind of a moment. So, you know, you, everyone has these, these uh, cultural references that, in fact, do keep arising in memory, much the same as these figures keep arising throughout this text. So, and then we have this very important phrase on the top of page 11 here. And one day will appear in our children's memories among their grandchildren and people not born. Like sexual desire, memory never stops. It pairs the dead with the living, real with imaginary beings, dreams with history. So in the midst of these fragments, we in fact have um, the, a few sort of proper paragraphs that have indentations and that have you know, regular punctuation instead of having these M dashes or these fragmentary sentences. And what I love about this one is, you know, we're only a few pages into a book that again has a lot of white space on the page. It's a book that reads fairly quickly, at least in the beginning. This linking together of sexual desire here with memory. So she says, like sexual desire, memory never stops. So sexual desire, again, is something that is uh, woven throughout all of her works. And it's very important here because not only is it linked in this book to memory, but it is also linked to the act of writing. So one of the things that um, I would remind you to do when you are reading anything, but certainly when you're reading a text like this, that's a bit more challenging, is to focus on 
if you can hear that in the background, that is one of my bigger dogs snoring. I just don't even know what that might sound like to you. Oh my gosh, it's, it's so loud. It's so loud in here. But sorry, so this idea of sexual desire as being linked both to memory and writing is something that we will see again and again. And it's a topic we're going to take up in the second installment of this lecture. To, to, to sort of finish up this first chapter here, I want to um, just reflect a tiny bit on all of the different sort of amalgamation of things we have here. Again, that striking first sentence, all the images will disappear. Then we have the woman urinating, we have the um, movie star, we have the thalidomide baby as a man. Wow, so awkward. Um, we have the elderly woman with Alzheimer's, we have the infant son, we have Scarlett O'Hara, we have Molly Bloom, we have a, a sort of a philosophical moment about uh, sexual desire and memory. A little later we have a, a quotation from Voltaire, we have some things that are in italics, which I am taking to mean um, th that they're either a song or a poem. Uh, and then we have a whole amalgamation here in parentheses of a bunch of sayings, which I had to look all of these up. There's things that, that are sort of puns that the family talks about. Um, and she says right here, they serve no purpose but to consolidate the family esprit de corps. So there's this sense of, of words as doing all sorts of different work here. Um, not only puns that are keeping her family together, or not her family, but a family, uh, but also all of these different images of these different people we are invited to, um, to conjure up in our memory. We have this whole set of fragments that come after that first striking sentence about images disappearing. And then at, on page 15, at the end of this very first brief chapter, we have another striking sentence, everything will be erased in a second. And it's interesting to think about um, what she's talking about here. Um, you know, there's a real preoccupation with the sense of, of time passing. And I think this idea of um, everything being erased in a second, it's, it, it, it's that life, you know, life is, what it is when someone is extinguished, when a person dies, all of their memories, all of the images, all of the things that are evocative for them, all of that will disappear. Everything will be erased in a second. So there is this sense of, of urgency, this sense of the ephemeral. It's just an absolutely beautiful opening to, uh, to a text that really defies genre. And um, I hope you join us for the second installment because we're going to take an, a look at what essentially is a sort of a second opening. A little bit like Madame Bovary, we have sort of that first opening with Charles in the schoolyard. And then when we have Madame Bovary herself sort of come on the scene, it feels in fact like a second opening. We have very much the same thing here. We have this um, very beautiful, but very fragmented and very sort of philosophical first chapter that will be followed by something um, that, that's going to sort of ground us a bit more in the text. That's something is a chapter we're gonna take a look at in the second installment. So please join me to continue our conversation of this incredible novel, Les Années, The Years by Annie Ernaud. I have to admit that I was laughing at myself when I was editing the first part of my uh, lectures on uh, Annie Ernaud because I realized that just after I told you guys how important it was to pay attention, I skipped right over the epigraphs. So yes, it's important to look at the title and yes, it's important to look at the first paragraph. It's also very important to take a look at any epigraphs that a writer chooses to, uh, to include. I, and I love the ones that she chooses there, you know, as, as you can imagine that someone who is this seasoned in terms of writing and someone who is this smart and this educated in literature, she really did um, an amazing job. The first is, all we have is our history and it does not belong to us. So this is Jose Ortega y Gasset. He was a, a Spanish philosopher and writer and one of the important things about that not is not only the sort of ephemeral nature of history and how it cannot belong to anyone because it's not something that you can sort of have and hold on to, but also it really speaks to the collectivity 
um, th this collective kind of narrative that Ami Arnaud is about to uh, treat us to. Chekhov is our second writer, and we're just going to look at the very top. Yes, they'll forget us. Such is our fate, there is no help for it. A couple of things I love about this. One is that this idea of yes, they'll forget us. The yes there, I love the fact that this feels like it's almost in dialogue. Someone has asked the question, you know, are they going to forget us? And that person is forgotten. You know, that half of the dialogue has been totally elided. So yes, they'll forget about us. Such is our fate, there is no help for it. And what I love here is that, that Chekhov is actually fairly um, sort of sanguine and is like, well, maybe they'll think we're sinful and maybe they'll think this and maybe they'll think that. Um, but again, it's this idea of um, we are meant to be forgotten. And, and I think one of the things Ami Arno is getting at here is, yes, we, an individual, is going to be gone in, you know, in, in a second. Everything will be erased. All of the images will disappear. And yet we as, as a human, I mean, eventually the entire human race will, um, you know, be forgotten. Um, but I do think that there's this notion here of, of, of wanting to sort of, of wanting to capture this collectivity, wanting to capture the, the history of the French people. Then we dove into the first, in the first session, we dove into this first chapter, which I love the fragmentation. I love that she's, we're really kind of, to use a terrible idiom, we're out of the frying pan and into the fire here. We're just jumping right into the flames at the beginning of the book because it's not, um, you know, we're, this is not sort of a gentle landing. There isn't a lot of context. It, we're just right into this idea of this collective culture. And then uh, on page 17, so we're, you know, we're a little ways into, uh, into this novel, not a novel, I, it reads sometimes like a novel, but actually not really. <laughs> so we're into this text up at the top here, that first paragraph on page 17. It is a sepia photo, oval shaped, glued inside a little cardboard folder with a gold border and protected by a sheet of embossed semi-transparent paper. So this is some of that acuity. We have these details that are, um, just like with Flaubert, we really are seeing the entire world of this photo and everything that it is evoking. Below are the words, photo moderne, Ridel, Lillebonne, and then I don't know what that other stuff means. Lillebonne is the name of the town where, where Ami Arnaud was born. I love that she's including the telephone number there. I don't know what those words are. Maybe it's like the, um, maybe it's the, the province or whatever. Um, and then it says, a fat baby with a full pouty lower lip and brown hair pulled up into a big curl sits half naked on a cushion in the middle of a carved table. So we, what we are looking at here is a baby photograph. And uh, as I mentioned before, the photographs are very important because they sort of anchor us in, in a specific person. But Annie Arnaud is always resisting this. So if we look at page 229, which is still part, it's at the very end of the text, but it's part of the novel, we are going to discuss either today or in the third session, the, the sort of meta qualities that are in this book. So she talks a lot about the writing process and what this book is meaning to do. So we will discuss this more deeply, but this is a very good example of this kind of meta thing, meta in this case, a meta narrative, simply being a chunk of narrative that is about the writing of the narrative. It, on the top of page 229 here, it says right here, an outpouring but suspended at regular intervals by photos and scenes from films that capture the successive body shapes and social positions of her being. Freeze frames on memories and at the same time reports on the development of her existence. The things that have made it singular not because of the nature of the elements of her life, whether external, social trajectory, profession, or internal, thoughts and aspirations, the desire to write, but because of their combinations, each unique unto itself. So she's discussing these photographs that she's going to periodically give to us and how each of the combinations, you know, maybe where she is physically, whether she is at school or whether she's a small girl or whether she's a grandmother sitting with a granddaughter, Importantly, uh, it's followed by this next uh, line that says, this incessantly not she of photos will correspond in mirror image to the she of writing. 
So this idea of, of the alienation of the photograph is very clear. So when she discusses, when our narrator is talking about she, this omnipotent narrator is talking about she, there is a distancing that happens. So when she says, you know, there's a, there's a semi-naked baby sitting there, she's not saying there was a baby picture of me or there was a picture of me when I was one. She's, she's, she's distancing, the narrator is distancing herself from this she. So even as Ernaud is anchoring us in the text by giving us, you know, this sort of autobiographical photographs, there's also this real distancing that is happening. Of course, this she um, who is, is distancing us from, or is distancing the photographs from the narrator, is that that gap is going to be filled by all of the text around these photographs. So if you look here, if we go back now to page 17 to look at the text about the photograph, first what she's going to do is distance us more. The misty background, the sculptured garland of the table, the embroidered chemise that rides up over the belly, the baby's hand hides its sex. There's, you know, there's always through Annie Ernaud, there's always going to be this emphasis on sex, even in this infant here um, who is naked and hiding her, her sex. There's a lot, she has an entire book called Laund, the, the, the shame. There's a lot about shame in the book. And so right even at the beginning in this very first image, we have this idea of needing to cover, um, cover your sex. The strap slipping from the shoulder onto the chubby arm suggests a cupid or a cherub from a painting. All the relatives must have received a print and immediately tried to discern whose side the child took after. In this piece of family archives, which must date from 1941, it is impossible not to read a ritual petit bourgeois staging for the entrance into the world. So again, we have this really excellent echo of Flaubert here. We have this kind of uh, lower middle class, this petit bourgeois, um, this idea of, of um, you know, the, the, the baby that looks like a cherub and this idea, the importance of sending not just a photograph, but this, um, you know, an oval shaped photograph in a, in a cardboard folder and the gold embossing and, and the kind of the crazy getup and the baby looking like a cherub and, and the sort of sculptured table, all of these different things are, are very firmly putting us in this kind of middle class here. It's, it's a remarkable uh, thing that she's doing because we have all of these fragments that are, that are sort of speaking to like this very, very broad um, sense of how ephemeral things are and this very broad cast of characters. And then we are focusing in on this one baby. And I think readers automatically think, okay, this is going to be, this is Ami no, like this is, we are now in somewhat more familiar territory. And yet there still is that really kind of that distance that comes from the fact that when the narrator is describing it, it's, you know, it's a sepia photo below are the words. So there's, there's just as much emphasis on the frame as there is on the baby. And when we have, you know, when we first have the baby, a fat, a fat baby um, with a full pouty lower lip, the baby's hand hides its sex. So there's this idea of a baby, the baby. It certainly is not, um, Annie Arnaud is not inviting us to see this baby as uh, an iteration of herself. And yet that is in fact what we do. Um, we have throughout the entire book, we have this incredible balancing of these kind of fragmentary uh, lists and these philosophical paragraphs that are um, interspersed and, and, and sort of um, intertwined with these photographs. And as the, the text progresses, we do have more of a sense that, that the photographs are Annie Ernaud. In fact, I, my sense was that uh, I had more and more information about her toward the end, not just because it had accumulated, but my sense was toward the end of the book, um, this narrator was, was showing us a little more of, you know, of herself. We were having a little more of a personal experience toward the end of the book. But throughout, you do have the sense of this one person anchoring us, and yet this is very much a collective story. So the structure is echoing this idea of a collective, but the other thing that is echoing it, and I think it's important for, um, for English readers to take note of, is the, the grammatical um, collective. So, it, and this is how it's done. So if we look at page 236 of the book, um, this is the translator's note, and it's important. So in English, we have a second person plural pronoun, which is we, 
So I is the first person singular and we is the first person uh, plural. So it's, it's more than one person, but it is including yourself. It's a collective we, um, which is very strong and, and it is used a lot. Uh, throughout this book, but in French, they also have the, the pronoun on, O-N, which means in English, it would most likely be uh, translated into one. One did this, one did that, or the passive voice, like it was done. Um, but in French, on as a pronoun has replaced we. It's so interesting that the linguist in me loves this. So on as in like one does this and one does that, is, is um, conjugated the same way that the third person singular is. So it's il, elle, on. All of those are all conjugated in the same way. And they're, they're conjugated in lots of ways, in, in ways that are closer to the first person singular. So French has done this very cool thing where the second person plural, the we form, which has lots of exceptions and is oftentimes conjugated in a different way, that has really fallen out of use, certainly in spoken French. I mean, not entirely, but but it is used much less. You almost always have people saying, oh, like we did this and we did that. What you would say in English is replaced by this pronoun, which is so handy. It's just, I love the idea of a language sort of streamlining itself. And certainly as a um, as a non-native speaker of French, I love that you can use on and not worry about all of those tricky uh, second person plural conjugations. But what we lose a little bit um, in the English translation is that in the French, sometimes Ami Ernaud will use on, as, which is this kind of collective we, but it's also the third person. And sometimes she will use nous, um, not as often, but that is more this kind of straightforward we kind of feeling, the second person plural. She also will use um, she or he. So there's this real melding. And, and actually, our, um, our translator, she says on 234, to write in the je collectif in French, Annie Ernaud uses the nous or the on, which I translate mostly as we, but sometimes as one, for formality or rhythm or simply because it is the only choice that presents itself. Very occasionally, I use the impersonal you, she also uses il, elle, the plural forms of those, they, or les gens, people, and later in the paragraph switches pronouns, often more than once to on, or nous, or il. So he's, she starts out talking about she did this, she did that, but then very clearly when it is the same person, she starts talking about we, or on. And so that sense of, of um, all of those different pronouns, which we lose a little bit of them in English, because we either have to use the passive voice or just we, um, we lose that sense of collectivity. Not, not entirely, it's still there. But in French, there is a much stronger sense of the collective because all of these different pronouns, I, we, he, she, one, all of these speak to the same kind of um, entity, the same being. They're all kind of mixed together in a way that's, that's it's truly, it makes it feel very much um, like a communal kind of description and experience. So we, so it's very important to note not only that is, um, you know, all of these cultural references and the historical references throughout the years are about a collective group, but in fact, the very grammar is reinforcing this structure, this kind of combination between this one person, this, the, this person who we see these images of through the years, but also um, th this kind of communal we. Not only does Ami Ernaud have this amazing ability to use this je collective, this I, this communal I, but she also um, has this incredible ability when she is using certain details and she's talking about certain rites of passage to have these uh, paragraphs and scenes that feel both very specific and also totally universal. Uh, if we look at the bottom of page 76 here, Having failed to panic in time, somewhere in a pine wood or on the sands of Costa Brava, one saw time stand still before a pair of underpants whose crotch had remained spotless for days. So a couple of things here. Um, this is a very specific, you know, both um, with the pine wood um, or in the sands of Costa Brava. So this, these are different, different places, obviously, where the, our young narrator or one of her cohort has had some sort of a liaison. And I love here how it's um, we have we saw time stand still. 
this idea of time with the capital T here, time is obviously one of the huge themes of the book. And I love the idea that um, this capitalization of the word is, you know, whether or not you noticed, it doesn't matter because somewhere, well, it matters a little bit. But somewhere in there, um, it, it is um, evoking something specific and, and adding a little bit of punch, a little oomph to the idea of time. And this idea of the crotch of the underpants and the idea of um, having to having failed to panic in time, all of these are, are, are giving us a sense of, of a younger person who is, you know, panicking, the stakes are very high, but the crotch of the underpants, there's a real intimacy along with the kind of... I mean, it's incredible when you think about the intimacy of, of, of a passage like this, and yet how kind of general we are still. This is not, it's not a story of any one person. It's not a story of one young woman. And yet it, it can feel very intimate. It had to be got rid of one way or another. Rich girls went to Switzerland, others to the kitchen of an unspecialized, unknown woman with a probe boiled in a stew pot. In the French version, the stew pot is a, it's like a, an Instapot. There's like a name, a brand name for it. It would be like in a crock pot, um, which there, there are a lot of, um, in the French, there are a lot of, uh, it, it's confusing as an English reader, but there are a lot of names that are very specific that I think, you know, if someone says to you, Bain de Soleil, or if someone says to you, um, Tab, Soda, you know, they're, they're those names for brands that are that are very evocative. And in this case, it's very sort of harrowing. It's not just a stew pot, but it's like someone's using their rice cooker to um, sanitize instruments for an abortion. The fact of having read Simone de Beauvoir was of no use except to confirm the misfortune of having a womb. Incredible. So we have this panic. We have these very specific times. Um, we have this this um, sort of evocation of, of what would happen, whether it was Switzerland. So we're bringing in the class consciousness here. You know, if you're rich, you go to Switzerland. If you're not, there, it's literally, um, you know, like rice cooker time. Wow, that sounds so callous the way that I'm saying that. Um, and then I love the idea of of time and idea of social class and, and it sort of ending with this idea of, of Simone de Beauvoir and all of this kind of feminist philosophical, um, you know, research as really doing no good at all except for confirming the misfortune of having a womb. And, and there is, you know, in, in a lot of a lot of literature of this time, I think it's easy for us in 2023 to forget how how um, really, really impactful this idea of uh, of birth control is, frankly. I mean, it's it's a very it's it looms large throughout this entire entire novel. One suspects that that is why um, Annie Arnaud got married to someone who she divorced a couple of years later. So, um, the, the 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 high stakes of someone who has you know a very healthy desire for sex, but who also is living as a woman at a time when birth control was not reliable and not easy to get in a Catholic country. Um, it, it, there's really a, a very palpable sense of how difficult that is throughout this entire work. And to wrap up this, I, I wanted to take a quick look at the idea of, of how these phrases or the, the, these scenes that Annie Arnaud is so good at constructing, um, allowing them both to be very specific and yet to remain very kind of universal and general. Part of the power of them is the way that they accumulate throughout the course of the work. So in the text, we have this idea of abortion, the word abortion, it comes up again and again and again. And here we have um, on page 164, so significantly later in the text, we have at the bottom of page 164, we have a line that reads, we who had undergone kitchen table abortions, who had divorced and believed our struggle to free ourselves would be of use to others, we're now overwhelmed by fatigue. So every time you um, you have a, a mention of either abortion itself as an issue or of the threat of having gotten pregnant, every time Ami Arnaud uh, introduces these ideas, there's a slightly different cant to it. We're moving toward it in, from a little different position, either as 
a married woman later or as a very young girl um, who is sort of struggling to figure out even the mechanics of sex. I had a, a, a teacher during, an, um, during the three quarters of an MFA that I did uh, who told us that you can bring up the same image or you can bring up the same item or the same detail as many times as you want, but every time uh, it needs to have a different inflection. It needs to be doing some sort of different work. And Annie Arnaud is so good at this. So each time we see um, Molly Bloom, who again is uh, Leopold Bloom's wife in Ulysses by James Joyce, or every time we see Scarlett O'Hara, there's a different inflection, partly because of the context and because of the accumulation throughout the book itself, but also because Ani Arnaud is skilled enough that she's giving us um, a, a, a different look at it. So in the beginning, when she's talking about abortion, it's this really urgent sense of, um, of panic and of lives changing. And, you know, when she mentions Simone de Beauvoir as not being helpful, there's also that real juxtaposition and the real danger that, you know, if you want to be an intellectual, and she says at some point that she didn't want to get married, she didn't want to have children, she um, found it would, or she thought it would be incompatible to have an intellectual life and to be a writer while also being a wife and mother. So you, you have this, um, you know, early on, the idea of an unwanted pregnancy is, a, um, is, is something that is threatening and something that is urgent and the cause of panic. And then later on page 167, we have this idea of fatigue. We have this idea of, um, you know, at one point having thought that the women's uh, liberation and that, you know, even having a diaphragm, having access to any birth control was sort of groundbreaking and was going to make the lives of everyone else easy, but, or easier. But later in the, in the text, we have this real sense of fatigue. So one of the things that Erno is so good at is this repetition, is this kind of, um, th this dredging back up, just the way that memory would do it, you know, this dredging back up of, um, of an image or of a person or of an event. And, and yet, um, just exactly the way memory works, you, every time you're reminded of something, you have a slightly different take on it because you're older, because you're in a different context, because it has come up, uh, in different circumstance. So in um, the way that she is able to do this in a text like this again and again with so much power is really one of um, the more impressive, I think, elements of, of, the, uh, of the work. So thank you very much for joining section two of our three-part deep dive into Les Années of Annie Arnaud and the Years by Annie Arnaud. And um, please join us for the third chunk where I will be wearing yet another outfit for those of you who are watching on YouTube. Um, this is going to be much more appropriate, potentially, uh, you know, a much more staid outfit, one that comes from toward the very end of the book, where Annie Ernaud is uh, a grandmother. So please join us for the third section, and thank you for listening. Welcome back, everyone, to the third installment of our discussion of Annie Ernaud's uh, incredible, in fact, Nobel Prize winning volume, Les Années. For those of you who are uh, watching the YouTube channel, you can see that to, uh, for this third installment, I've, in, I've uh, donned my third outfit, which comes directly from a description in the book of Annie Ernaud in a photograph with her two sons and um, one of their girlfriends where she is wearing on the beach a, um, a beige sweater and a loosely knotted scarf. So that's what we've got going on here. And uh, as always in the background, we have a snoring dog or two. Um, so if you hear that little drone in the background, it's not um, a fellow listener who has fallen asleep. It is in fact one of the dogs. Um, and for those of you who are watching, I the, the French version of uh, of Annie Ernaud's books these days come with this really cool kind of banner thing, this Prix Nobel de Littérature, um, which I just love. I love all the fanfare. It's so well deserved. Um, the American version uh, has the, the little circle up here, which is also great. Um, but there there is just something really excellent about the, the tangibility and the, the boldness of this uh, announcement. Because in fact, obviously the Nobel Prize in Literature is an enormous, enormous Thing to have won 
Annie Arnaud being uh, the first French woman to do so. I think there are like 19 French writers who have, or 15 or something like that. I'm not a numbers gal, but she is in fact the first French woman. And it is so well-deserved, again, for that clinical acuity, but the way that she has treated memory and the way that she has created this vision in Les Années, but also in her other works of this collective uh, French society and, and really like a, a, a very large breadth, you know, from, from her birth essentially in 1940, all the way to 2008. Uh, okay, we're gonna continue the discussion today. We're going to discuss sexuality, which is I think one of the strongest uh, sort of themes, one of the strongest uh, uh, sort of veins that Annie Arnaud taps in this book, Les Années. Uh, then we'll discuss feminism, and finally we'll take a look at the close of the novel. So we're gonna dive right into sexuality and um, we're gonna look at page 193. I find this so striking and I think it's worth reading some larger chunks than usual just because the presence of sexuality is so tangible in the book, but I also really am fascinated by the connection that Annie Arnaud makes um, very consistently between sensuality, sexuality, her, her own sex drive and her own experiences of sex between all of that and the act of writing. So there's this, this very strong link between sex and the creative force behind her writing. So um, I, I love this, we're gonna delve into this long um, passage on 194 and 195, absolutely masterful. But one of the things that I like about it, you know, we're toward the end of the book here, is that all of that, this kind of long exegesis, it's not that long, don't let me scare you, um, the, the, sort of this, this profound exegesis about writing and about the act of writing and sexuality is all within the context of her. I believe she's 69 and she, that seems funny to me just because of the sexual overtones, you getting it? She might be 68, she might be 58, but she is with a, um, her younger lover who is 29. So um, down at the bottom of 193, it says, Often as she lies against him in the half-sleep that follows love on Sunday afternoons, she lapses into a state that is like no other. And then we're going to skip a bit uh, to the top of the next page. She feels herself in several different moments of her life that float on top of each other. Time of an unknown nature takes hold of her consciousness and her body too. It is a time in which past and present overlap without bleeding into each other and where it seems she flickers in and out of all the shapes of being she has been. It is a sensation she's had before. So it's so interesting because this, this, this feeling, this post-coital feeling that she's having of, of herself and sort of all of these many iterations is also a really apt description of the way the book is functioning. So at any point in the book, we have um, these, this evocation of her as, you know, in, in the sort of front story of her as a teenager. And yet a lot of the collective and a lot of the voices, um, whether it be direct quotation by somebody else, whether it be a cultural reference, a historical reference, there is this sense of, of um, all of these layers layering on top of each other, even just in the formatting of the book, in the, in the sense that we have these lists uh, that in the French version are, are not introduced by any kind of punctuation. They have a lowercase letter that they start with. They're truly fragmentary. Um, in, the, in this translation, they in fact add a little M dash to, to sort of clarify and also a space break. In the French, they're much denser and, and these lists are sort of, um, they feel both more fragmentary and also in fact, um, more uh, sort of more cohesive in some ways, just because textually in the formatting, they're all part of a whole. So she's describing this feeling. Now in a state of expansion and deceleration, she takes hold of the sensation. She has given it a name, the palimpsest sensation. Though the word is not quite accurate if she relies on the dictionary meaning, a manuscript on which the original writing has been scratched out to make room for later writing. She sees it as a potential instrument of knowledge that is not only for herself, but general, almost scientific, though a knowledge of what she doesn't know. 
So a couple of quick comments about the idea of a palimpsest. So this is a very um, important literary term. My my. If my graduate school, um, my early graduate school learning uh, for the PhD in literature, not the MFA that came later, <laughs> um, if, if that does not fail me, the palimpsest in fact comes from those illuminated manuscripts back before we had the, the printing press where those manuscripts would be, you know, um, copied out by hand. And as they were copied over and over again, uh, there would be, you know, things would be elided, things would be scratched out, other things would be written in the margins or in between the lines. So there's this idea of, of this palimpsestic mode as, as having this hugely long sort of cultural origin, not long, but like it came from a long, long time ago. You know, this is from the medieval era um, even before the Gutenberg Bible and before the printing press, um, which is what, 1044? I think that's the Battle of Hastings. Do not quote me on any of these dates. Um, but but the, the idea of this printing press, before that you had this palimpsestic mode. But there is this kind of a sacredness, again, because we can think about these illuminated manuscripts. Um, but the fact that she is saying at this point, this very late point in the novel, she doesn't know what it is exactly uh, that she's trying to capture is actually, it's so beautiful because there's a humility in it. And again, at this point, um, you know, the reader is really immersed in this entire world, this entire sort of vision of all French culture and French history, not all culture, but you know, this, this vision of it. Um, but we, it, it is true that it's not exactly clear what it is that she is evoking, what it is that she is saving. And then I love how very specific this gets here. This is again, this idea of sexuality, you know, again, we have to remember that this is, you know, she, this is after love on a Sunday afternoon. So she is with this younger lover. Um, and, and yet she gets very specific here about this writing project. In her writing project about a woman who has lived between 1940 and today, which grips her ever more tightly with sorrow and even guilt for not committing it to paper, she would like to begin with this sensation, no doubt influenced by Proust, one of a need to base her undertaking on a real experience. So it's so interesting, again, that here on page 194, we're very close to the end of this piece of writing, and yet she's talking about how she's going to begin it. The important um, you know, reference here to Proust is the idea, of course, of the Madeleine, that he has this, this bite of this tea-soaked Madeleine and it evokes his entire childhood. And, and she's done very much the same in that, um, and you know, the, the title In Search of Lost Time, which is the translation for A la Recherche du Temps Perdu. Um, there is this sense that she's doing the same thing that Proust is doing in that volume, um, that very important seminal work. Here she is also doing that same sort of thing. She's beginning with her childhood. In fact, there's kind of a prehistory in that amazing first chapter. And then she's kind of diving into these photographs that show her as a very, very young child. Um, and yet what she's doing is radically different than, than what Proust was doing. And then I love how she's going to go even deeper into this feeling. And when she says it is a sensation, she again is reminding us that she is talking about this post-coital, um, you know, this languor and this, this sort of rarefied feeling that comes from having um, this very close connection with someone. It is a sensation that pulls her inexorably and by degrees away from words and all language. Back to her first years, bereft of memory, the rosy warmth of the cradle through a series of abims. So an abim is a, is a, um, is like a, uh, it's like an abyss. It's like a, like a, um, like a gap. Um, those of birthday, the painting of Dorothea Tanning, which if you'd like to see a copy of that and just hear my very quick commentary, uh, tune in to the YouTube channel if you're not already there. Uh, the painting by Dorothea Tanning that eliminate all her actions, all events, everything she has learned, thought, and desired, and which has been brought over the years to be here in this bed with this young man. So if you, like me, have lost the beginning of that sentence, don't worry, I'm going to go back a little bit. So it is a sensation that pulls her away from words and all language. The elimination of all, so she's, she's, she's um, getting into this idea of sort of like a pre-language thing. Um, uh, the rosy warmth of the cradle, 
um, through a series of, of gaps or abysses that eliminate all her actions, all events, everything she has learned, thought, and desired, and which has brought her over the years to this bed with this young man. So there's a sense here of, of language as not being up to the task. There's an idea of, um, you know, she's getting toward the end of, in fact, the, the this aim that she is describing here. She's getting even toward the end of it and doesn't feel entirely satisfied, which she really, uh, she's going to some pains to remind us of that. It is a sensation that cancels out her history Whereas in her book, she would like to save everything that has continually been around her. She wants to save her circumstance. And is the sensation itself not a product of history, of such great changes in the lives of women and men that one can feel it at the age of nearly 58, 58, not 69, sorry everybody, um, lying beside a man of 29. So I love the way that she, at this point, has has tied very securely the idea of sexuality, this idea of this um, sort of sex-induced state where she finds herself and where she gets very close to the idea of creativity and, and is able to both articulate the shortcomings, the ways that language will fail her. But this, um, again, we're on page 194, and there has been a lot of discussion of, or at least touching on sexuality throughout the book in some very bold ways that I, that I really love. So um, a lot of that, those earlier um, instances where sexuality or sex comes up, I think are sort of leading us toward this idea on 194. So if we look at page 67, this is relatively early on. If you recall, you know, we have that first chapter, then we have her childhood. So here we are, 67, you know, she's still a teen. Born on this tide of emotion, we moved from a slow dance to a cot or the beach with a man's sex only seen in photos, and even then, and semen in our mouth, having recalled the Ogino calendar just in time and refused to open our thighs. I don't know about you, reader, but um, when I got to that part, sorry, to a cot or on the beach with a man's sex and semen in our mouths. So there's this um, very kind of graphic and, and this idea of a man's sex, it's, it sort of alienates us um, from, from like the romance or the, the kind of misty, um, you know, uh, idealization of the sexual act to then the idea of semen in the mouth. So there's this sense of um, the very sort of uh, tangible aspects of, and the very kind of shocking aspects of an early sexual experience. So this is doing one of the things that literature I think does so well, which is it's a little shocking as the reader to come across this um, with a man sex, then this little parenthetical, and then, and semen in our mouth. Um, I love the fact that mouth here is is collective. So this is the collective mouth of all of these young girls. And I think a bit of the surprise that comes on the part of the reader is meant to mirror, in fact, the surprise of the young girl who, um, you know, during fellatio would suddenly be having this experience of semen in her mouth as if from nowhere. <laughs> okay, and then um, we're going to look at page 104. So this is um, a little bit further on and she's now uh, discussing how suddenly everything that was taboo is not taboo anymore. And there's a bit of irony here, but it plays well, I think, against all of the other mentions of sexuality that she has made along the way. So on 104 up here, the discourse of pleasure reigned supreme. You had to feel pleasure while reading, writing, taking a bath, defecating. It was the alpha and the omega of human activities. Then we have this nice space break. We reflected on our lives as women. We realized that we'd missed our share of freedom, sexual, creative, or any other kind enjoyed by men. So I, I read the second part purposefully because she does link together um, this freedom, sexual, creative, or any other kind. Again, there's this very tight relationship between sexuality and creativity. And here she's starting to get, she's starting to sort of doubt whether or not women are um, getting their full share of either of those things, either the ability to create or the idea of, um, of, of, of sort of free sexual fulfillment. And importantly, she was a professor throughout her life. Um, she also, uh, uh, I believe, 
both at the college level. I know she taught high school for a while as well. Um, but there is an important idea here that she not only was teaching her entire life, but she had this incredible, um, you know, prolific output of these short novels. Um, it, well, short auto fiction, kind of a, a cross between memoir and novel, but we'll have to be working the whole time. Uh, okay, and then here on page 134, I loved this. This is such a, again, such an interesting melding of the idea of sensuality. At one point, she likens um, being up close to her lover's body as being up close to her mother's body. And as an American reader, maybe this is very American of me, I was a little like, ooh, wait, that's kind of strange to, to have like that kind of melding of, of an intimate moment with a lover as being equivalent um, or at least evocative of a, mo of a moment of physical intimacy with a mother. But I think that, um, you know, again, this is one of those sort of taboos that I think she's getting to, this sense, that palimpsestic sense of, of, of being physically intimate with someone else, which would evoke, um, y you know, a different sense, but, but sort of the same, uh, in some ways, the same sensations for her. Um, on page 134, we have a different kind of uh, parallelism here between sexuality and motherhood. Again, 134, this is right in the middle. She's on a family vacation with her two young sons and her husband. At the Hotel Escorial in Toledo, wakened by the sound of moaning, she rushed, rushed next door to check on the children who were quietly sleeping. Returning to bed, she and her husband realized it was a woman in the throes of an interminable orgasm, her cries rebounding off the patio walls into all the rooms with open windows. Once her husband had fallen back to sleep, she could not keep from masturbating. There is so much happening here. So she's inspired by the jouissance, by the orgasm of another woman. Um, her husband is not, this has nothing to do with men. It has nothing to do with her husband, meaning her sexual gratification is not coming from her husband. Um, it also is sort of bound up in this maternal worry. There's a sense of um, le petit mort in French, kind of famously, maybe you're aware of this, um, like an orgasm is known as a little death. So there's this idea of uh, also of an abîme, like that, that kind of gap, that kind of lack. You know, you sort of lose that consciousness um, famously. Uh, at, at, during orgasm, your sense of self. So it's that kind of um, complex experience that she is trying to capture in all of these different ways and I think doing an amazing job of it. We're going to move now from this idea of sexuality toward the idea of feminism. So the two are linked. Uh, there is a sense of her sort of sexual boldness and also her sense of, um, you know, the ease with which she is talking about masturbation or or sex in general and, and, and the real threat of sex ending in pregnancy. All of that is kind of tied together with feminism. So we're gonna take a look um, at page 164. Again, we're back to 164. Here we have another chunk of texts that I think are really important. And these are very good examples also of the kind of um, sort of philosophical slash political uh, musings. They're not musings. They're really like statements that she is making. My scarf is totally falling off as I'm talking here. Um, so on 164, women more than ever were a closely watched group whose behaviors, tastes, and desires were subject to assiduous discourse and unease, triumphant attention. So one quick thing here about the way that these sentences are reading, um, and I should have mentioned this before because it was even more pronounced in, in the other passage, there is a, a kind of urgency in the prose and a kind of breathlessness that our Canadian translator has discussed. She, the translator in the uh, English version, has taken the liberty of adding quite a few full stops, otherwise known as periods, um, she has added them to, to sort of break up some of this kind of long-winded Proustian kind of prose. So it's a little bit unfortunate to my mind because I really love the, the, the sort of urgency and the breathlessness that comes with um, this, this prose that sort of doesn't let you stop. You kind of keep hurtling on and on. It's, I think, one of the main reasons why I keep reading somewhat longer passages is because she really doesn't make it easy to stop reading, partially just because of the syntax in the French version, but also because the ideas that she is promoting and that she is delving into are, in fact, really um, significant and, and, and well-developed. Okay, 
we're talking about women now. They were now deemed to have it all and be everywhere. Girls did better at school than boys. As usual, people looked for signs of emancipation in women's bodies, in their sexual and sartorial daring. The fact that they talked about cruising guys, discussed their fantasies, and wondered aloud in L if they were good in bed was proof of their freedom and their equality with men. So we had a little bit of irony before about this idea of you have to have pleasure doing everything, reading, defecating, all of that. Um, it was the alpha and omega of, of, of human you know, existence. And here we have a little more of that irony. So any kind of um, female liberation has to be taken with a grain of salt. So we skip down a little bit here. And, and again, I think it's really important to note that, that the sexuality, this idea of cruising guys and am I good in bed, um, th th that women's liberation, which of course has everything to do with contraception, um, it, it is very co closely tied here. This, the sexual freedom of women, it's closely tied with the creative impulse to write and to be professional, but it's also, um, which actually is the same thing that it's also tied to, which is this idea of, of liberation, this idea of, of freedom as a female. And by the way, all of this is kind of in the, let's see, this has got to be the 80s that we're talking about here, which checks out. Um, and then we're going to read it kind of a little bit lower down. Feminism was a vengeful, humorless, old ideology that young women no longer needed and viewed with condescension. So this is kind of that second wave of feminism where, you know, and, and Annie Ernaud would have been very much a part of that first generation, the Simone de Beauvoir, this, this kind of consciousness raising, this idea of really understanding the ways in which women and men um, were unequal. And then there comes this time in the 80s. I myself um, went to high school in the 80s and was sold that whole bill of goods that we were all sold in the late, late 80s which is that women could have it all. You can be a doctor and a mother, but also you still need to be able to set the table and you need to be a sexual being. You know, I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in the pan because I have this perfume that's going to make me sexy. Um, or, you know, Virginia Slims, you've come a long way. That was a little earlier than, than my time. But there was this real rhetoric that women had sort of arrived and that, you know, because we were sexually emancipated and we had contraception that was somewhat reliable, um, and, and because we were going to suddenly be earning equally to men, all of these different things, um, it was as if, you know, women, again, had arrived and no longer needed this feminism that Ami Ernaud was so careful to depict toward the beginning of the book. And then a little further down, the struggle of women sank into oblivion. It was the only struggle that had not been officially revived in collective memory. So she also, at this point, is talking a lot about how um, the threat of the right is political. The political right is rising again in France after May 68, um, which was a time of, of um, you know, the students, both in college and in high school, rising against the, um, the sort of elitist and right-leaning government of the time. Okay, and then the last part I want to read here, again, I just can't stop reading this Ami Erno because we have this urgent prose that's so beautiful um, and so clear. On 165, we no longer knew if the women's revolution had really happened. We continued to see blood after 50. It didn't have the same color or odor as before. It was a sort of illusory blood, but we were reassured by this regular scansion of time that could be sustained until death. We wore jeans, leggings, and t-shirts like girls of 15. Like them, we said my boyfriend when referring to our regular lover. As we aged, we ceased to have an age. I love this. I love the idea of, um, of the, you know, someone who was born in 1940 and then here, this could even be in the 90s, but um, she also talks about how this idea of not being able to have an age is this um, consumerist, you know, the, the, the obsolete technology and the idea that everything needs to be new and that old things don't have any value. Um, there, or the cult of youth among women, this idea that we need to be young, we need to dress young, we need to look young. Um, that would have been a real departure for a woman who was, you know, 17 in 1957. So there's a there's this beautiful, I would argue, this beautiful scope where we get to see so much of what has changed um, because everything is sort of on this even 
keel. We have this, this sort of um, constant presence and this collective that feels nice and wide so we can get a sense of the entire French culture, which becomes more and more global toward the end of the book. Um, but, but some of these, you know, these recurring, um, you know, things about youth or about sexuality or about um, politics, you know, sort of the circularity of history, it's all so beautifully depicted. Okay, I want to um, close by taking a look at one very beautiful, it's, it's funny, this is a very short passage um, on 214 that I just loved. And it was, um, it's always interesting to me after I finish a book and I've written up the lecture for you all, it's always interesting to me to go back and, um, well not go back, it's interesting to me to go about my day uh, and to think about what surfaces. And interestingly, one of the things that really surfaced for me was this beautiful passage that actually feels very uh, different. It's on page 214, which feels like a departure, but, but you know, a departure in a book that is practically made of departures. Here, um, here it is at the bottom of 214. The moon, when we looked up at night, shone fixedly on billions of people, a world whose vastness and teeming activity we could feel inside. Consciousness stretched across the total space of the planet toward other galaxies. The infinite ceased to be imaginary. That is why it seemed inconceivable that one day we would die. This is so beautiful to me. There's, there's this real timeless quality to it. I mean, she's literally evoking timelessness and immortality and galaxies and the earth and billions of people. I mean, this is, the scope is widening so, so far here. Um, and it's this beautiful sense of this moon. You know, there's that idea that we all are looking at the same moon. Um, it's this sense of unity. Um, and even as she is talking about how sort of the, the, the idea of never dying, whenever you're talking about the idea of never dying, you're also obviously really evoking the idea of death and mortality. And this idea of, of having become more and more global is, is um, it's this beautiful sense of, yes, we have all become more global. Um, there are a couple of times where she's talking about the, the billion people in Russia and the billions of people in China. Are there billions? I don't even know. But as she is discussing these very, very large numbers of human beings, she does this beautiful thing toward the end of the book here where we're all kind of under the same moon and we are in the same galaxy. And it's really just this beautiful um, uh, sort of moment in the book that stands out to me and has continued to stand out uh, as a slight departure, but also kind of underscoring everything that she has worked so hard to create. We're gonna look at the end of the book on page 230. I love the end of the book. It seems very consistent to me with the beginning of the book. We have this nice kind of bookend feel. Um, but but I also have a little quibble with Alison Strayer, our translator. So if we are on the top here of page 230. So the book to be written represented an instrument of struggle. She hasn't abandoned this ambition, but now more than anything, she would like to capture the light that suffuses faces that can no longer be seen and tables groaning with vanished food. The light that was already present in the stories of Sunday in childhood and has continued to settle upon things from the moment they are lived, a light from before. So not only do we have this beautiful evocation of the moon, but here we have this beautiful evocation of a different kind of light. I mean, it's the same light, it's the sunlight, uh, but this light that was suffused over all of these faces who are now gone um, and this food and, and one of the rituals, in addition to the photographs that we see periodically, uh, is is our is this this idea of these Sunday dinners? So she has them with her um, extended family when she's little, and then we even see her having them at you know with her sons. And it's this very important ritual th that that has spanned her entire life. Um, my my issue, my quibble here is that she says at one point that she um, would like to capture the light, and um, in that moment, the the French translation is saisir which is kind of like to seize, to seize this this um, light. And and capture here, I think um, I think it is apt. It's, it's sort of like seize the light. Um, but my problem is save. So when she gets down to the bottom of this paragraph, that beautiful paragraph about this light that she wants to capture, there's then the single word save. 
So what she means, and in the French it is sauver, which is to save as in like to keep or to salvage. Um, so then you have this series of, of uh, fragments that we are um, understanding that are things that she wants to capture. They're the things that she wants to keep or salvage. But the first time I read the English translation, my memory is so bad, um, that I was like, save. In my mind, I thought she meant accept. So she wants to chat, she wants to capture all of these things. And then when she says save, in my mind, I was like, accept, accept these things. So that might have only been me, but for anyone else who had that, um, that experience, just, you know, know that you are not alone because it seems like she wants to um, capture all of these things, save X, Y, and Z, meaning except for X, Y, and Z. So it, it's, um, I think it would have been better if, if it were maybe, I don't know if it was salvage. Salvage is, is a little different than sauvé. Sauvé is much closer to save, um, but it doesn't have that double meaning of except. So then just like in the beginning of the chapter of the book, we have these beautiful fragments. And then I love at the end here, save something from the time where we will never be again. It's such a beautiful and fragmentary and brief um, way to close the book. Uh, again, I was a little confused by the save part. Um, if you think about his sauvé, in, in order to salvage something from a time where we will never be again. The other thing that's really beautiful in the French is this is an example of on, um, and on has that beautiful kind of double meaning. It's not, it's not really a double entendre, it just has this, this evocation or this connotation of both one, so it means both one as the individual, but also this on, this collective we. So it's that really beautiful French thing where it is both talking about an individual and a collective. So I love the close of the book um, in French. I found the close of the book in English a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. Still beautiful, and I really feel like that last sentence hits exactly the right note, as you could say about so much uh, of the rest of the book. So thank you so much for uh, for joining me in this discussion of Annie Ernaud and her incredible book, incredible volume, The Years. Finally, now at the end, I've stopped calling it a novel. It's definitely not a novel. And I hope to take a, a deep dive into one of her other works. I just have to decide which one. For any of you who have a little bit of French, um, you know, even from high school, Annie Ernaud is such a good person to read because maybe not the years, because a lot of the, the prose is very sort of heady and a lot of the references might not resonate with you, but pick up any one of the rest of her books. I have them all right here and really treat yourself and your brain to a little workout with the French. Um, and I wanted to end for those of you who can see, I, I just have a, a, I have an image here, it's a little tricky to see, of my grandmother. And it's a black and white photo of my grandmother. She is in Stamford, Connecticut at her parents' house there and she has fallen out of a wheelbarrow, it, but it, she's ha laughing hard. Um, and she's wearing this beautiful white frock kind of dress. It's like a little shift with a little cap sleeve and some adorable flats that I'm just absolutely enthralled by. And she's clearly been playing with someone, um, maybe her older brother, Lincoln, maybe her father, Gutson, um, and, and has fallen out and someone has captured this moment that is, um, it is singular and I keep it here on my desk along with a portrait of my grandmother. Um, as you can see there, that is my grandmother right next to Joan Didion. These are the women who are showing me how to age. These are the women I'm looking to, to figure out how to, how to move um, through my 50s and beyond. And I, I loved the idea of finding a snapshot of my own and taking a second and comparing it a bit to um, what Annie Ernaud is doing in her work, just because I do think it can underscore a little bit of this universality and, and really the gift that she has given us with this novel. So thank you for tuning in. I hope, I hope you'll come back soon to listen to something else. Readers, thank you so much for tuning in today. The lectures really are the lifeblood of the Fox page, but you should really go to thefoxpage.com. There are five minute recommendations where I will predict in about five minutes whether you should or should not tackle Ulysses, or maybe why you shouldn't be so snobby about the recent uh, Leanne Moriarty beach read. There are also talks, no rereading required, on old favorites like Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, or Frog and Toad, which is quite frankly a literary masterpiece. 
There's also this very cool thing where you answer a couple of questions and this cool wheel spins around and spits out a recommendation that I think might be exactly what you need and it might be something that stretches you a little bit. Come and check out thefoxpage.com. Thanks for listening and mostly happy reading.